Good afternoon, everyone. Let's let's get started. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Tom Miles. I'm the dean of the University of Chicago Law School, and on behalf of the law school, the Coe Sander Institute in Law and Economics, the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics here at the University of Chicago, and the American Financial Exchange. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this discussion about banking and sustainability in the 21st century. At the University of Chicago, our faculty aspire to pursue bold ideas on matters of social consequence, and they are unafraid to challenge conventional wisdom. As a result, the university has been home to many intellectual breakthroughs, especially in the area of economics and finance, law and regulation. And when these intellectual breakthroughs occur, the ideas are not confined to campus. They have impact on the world. They influence, even reshape, how markets are organized, which markets exist, and how they are regulated. This series of discussion continues that tradition, focusing on the intersection of banking, regulation, and innovation. I look forward to the new ideas that will emerge from this series, as well as the new opportunities that will result from them. Opportunities to make our economy stronger and our world better. Again, welcome. Today's discussion will focus on the role of financial institutions and central banks in particular on sustainability. Environmental, social, and governance issues, or ESG issues as they, as they come to be called, are influencing business practices, strategies, and performance all across the globe. Today, we'll explore the impact of ESG criteria on management decisions related to investments, lending, and risk assessment. And we'll also consider the appropriate role for central banks in the ESG area. To begin our program, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Dr. Richard Sandor. Dr. Sandor is a leading financial innovator and entrepreneur. Throughout his distinguished career, he has introduced multiple financial innovations of tremendous importance, often operating well ahead of emerging trends. In the 1970s, while he was at the Chicago Board of Trade, Dr. Sandor developed the first interest rate futures contract. One of his creations from that period, the Treasury Bond Futures Contract, is now the most widely traded interest rate future in the world. Dr. Sandor also led the revolution in environmental markets. He developed the first spot futures markets for sulfur dioxide emission allowances, he created the first organized market for greenhouse gas emissions reductions, launched the Chicago Climate Exchange, which was followed by the Chicago Climate Futures Exchange and the European Climate Exchange. In 2015, Dr. Sandor established the American Financial Exchange, or AFX. It is an electronic marketplace for small and mid-sized banks to lend and to borrow short-term funds. AFX launched as an over-the-counter market to trade interbank loans and created an index interest rate that is set by market forces, or the American equivalent to LIBOR called the Ameribor Index. Were all this not enough, Dr. Sandor is also the Aaron Director Lecturer in Law at the University of Chicago Law School, where he regularly teaches a course on financial innovation and environmental markets. It's a delight and honor to introduce him. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Sandor to our program. Tom, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I appreciate the words and your association. And uh, uh, it's an introduction, Tom, that uh, my father would have been proud of and my mother would have believed. <laughs> I, I think the longer the introduction, it means the less there is to say about somebody, but I, I want to really tell you what a great pleasure it is to be here with you. The American Financial Exchange tagline has been commercial logic with social value, and we have had a partnership with the University of Chicago Law School, Becker Friedman and the Booth School of Business, in fact, in bringing topics that are of social interest. 
In the past, uh, we've had uh, Kathy Kreninger from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to talk about the consumer in the age of COVID-19. We've also co-hosted Yelena McWilliams, the head of the FDIC, along with Kim Saunders, to talk about minority depository institutions um, and what role they play in the economy and how banks can provide opportunities for minorities to create jobs and new businesses. In this vein, we are very proud today to talk about banking and sustainability. And as Dean Miles indicated, ESG is a very, very important issue. Our members are concerned what is their role? And I can honestly say with no hesitation whatsoever that our chat today with Mark Carney brings before you somebody whose preeminence is perhaps unmatched in the world. Uh, he has been a governor of two central banks. He's currently the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance. He's Prime Minister Johnson's financial advisor on COP26. He has had a strong academic training, a Harvard undergraduate and PhD in economics from Oxford, a distinguished role in the private sector, also currently serving as, in, as advisory roles in the Peterson Institute, Bloomberg Philanthropies, and I could go on and on. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a questions. We'll be joined by the Honorable Chris Giancarlo, the past chairman of the CFTC, and also a friend, but first join me in welcoming uh if we can mark carney mark <laughs> thank you richard it's a it's a great pleasure to be here with you richard and thank you tom for organizing and hosting and thank you um mark you're the special advisor to uh the prime minister for the upcoming cop 26 which the uk is hosting can you tell us a little bit about what that involves and what was your role in putting together a net zero finance coalition? Okay, so I think what it involves is very consistent with the motto, the vision uh, and the reality of the AFX, which is commercial logic with a social purpose. Uh, the work that I'm doing is on the private finance side and the objective is to put in place the information, the tools and the markets so that climate change can be as much a determinant of value as, as interest rates, uh, the path of interest rates or of credit risk. And as uh, this sophisticated audience knows, well, sometimes, you know, the, the interest rate is everything. Um, uh, sometimes credit risk is determinative. Uh, sometimes other factors are driving uh, underlying value. But, you know, climate change being part of that value equation, whether you're lending, uh, investing, hedging, et cetera. Now, what do we need to do that? Uh, we need you need information, you need a baseline of information. So we're getting that in place. Uh, and what we're shooting for, and Chris Giancarlo knows this well, because he was also around at the inception, uh, is TCFD disclosure as a baseline, be applied different way in different uh, jurisdictions, but that is a baseline. Secondly, we need banks risk managing uh, future climate risks, not just physical risks, but the risks that come from success in tackling climate change, which means that Prices are going to change, rules are going to change, competitiveness is going to change. So how does the lending book look under those circumstances and how might that affect strategy today? Um, and then very importantly, and you, you know this well from your history, setting up markets. Um, and one of the markets that isn't at scale uh, yet is uh, the market for carbon offsets, something you know well, and, and we have a shot to really launch that market in a way that's global and impactful and competitive. Uh, we need markets for blended finance, in other words, uh, a project financing effect into the emerging and developing world where some of the 
uh, specific sovereign risks are taken off by the development banks as they should do, and the private sector takes the commercial risk. Um, and the last thing we need, and um, which is what you referenced, Richard, is we need commitment from the, the sector. If, you've, if you have the information, you got the tools, you got the markets, and very importantly, you are operating in jurisdictions that want to move to net zero, countries that want to move to net zero, it's 130 and counting and welcome the United States uh, to be one of those now, critically important. Um, well, what's your plan then uh, as a bank, as an insurer, as an asset manager? And for uh, President Biden's summit last month, uh, we brought together uh, over 160 institutions, large, small from around the world, uh, who made these commitments um, to net zero. And you know the bottom line, um, for it, in, in true Chicago fashion, it's always important to look at the bottom line. The bottom line's uh, $70 trillion of balance sheet uh, that is being committed to net zero, in, and not just at some distant point, but with shorter term milestones and plans behind those milestones uh, in order to uh, finance companies uh, and people who are, who are part of the solution. Uh, you know, Make sure they have the capital they need to invest in reducing emissions. So that's, in a nutshell, what we're doing, you know, bringing that social value, the objective of getting to sustainability net zero, but through uh, unleashing uh, really the dynamism of the market. Mark, you and I go back a while and, and in 1997 through a mutual friend, uh, uh, Maurice Strong, uh, we oh. were at, uh, uh, Kyoto, and and I walked out of there with an enormous sense of enthusiasm. Um, the then Vice President Gore gave a rousing uh, speech about uh, climate change, and there was a great deal of optimism that the world would get right down to solving the problem. It's 25 years later, what's happened? Or how does the landscape <laughs> Well, it, it didn't quite, it, I think it's fair to say it didn't quite work. Um, uh, it was a start, but it didn't quite work. And, and uh, you know, there are a few reasons why it didn't work. One of them is, you know, the nature of international agreements and the way the world works. Um, people, the, this sort of tension between sovereignty and and uh, and and that, and uh, you know what's required internationally, and and one thing that countries rebelled against in the end, effectively, was the binding nature of, of Kyoto. It was a treaty; it was a binding treaty, and it had penalty mechanisms. And uh, if you fell behind, the sort of it, it was like falling behind on your debts, your payments. It compounded the problem, compounded. So it didn't work for that reason. Um, also, I don't think there was quite the urgency that was shared uh, uh, you know, amongst. The general populace that was shared by the those who knew. So we lost a lot of time. So what's changed since then, and why why are things moving now? I think a couple of things. First is that we have lost a lot of time, and the consequence of losing a lot of time has been more extreme weather events. I mean, I saw it overseeing the uh, reinsurance industry in the UK as their regulator. The the number of extreme weather events they were uh, underwriting or not underwriting, ideally for them, uh, continued to go up. So we, you know, the more severe physical impacts. Secondly, what's happened is, and 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 the public understanding of of, of the science and the movement uh, has only increased. Um, secondly, actually, the good news is the uh, economics of many of the technologies, at least initially, that we need have dramatically improved. So uh, it's less of a trade-off than it was uh, 25 years or so ago. Um, and thirdly, uh, we're getting in place um, the possibility, and I think this is really starting to gather momentum, of this virtuous circle between countries, society, I'll say it's that way, society manifest in objectives and policies consistent with that, becoming clearer, a financial sector that has the information it needs then commercial opportunity that's there. And uh, that's all self-reinforcing because the more I'm confident as a policymaker, climate policymaker, that money's gonna be put to work and start to smooth this adjustment, the more likely I am to uh, tighten policy down the road. I'll give you two very quick examples. Um, in Canada, where I'm sitting, carbon price legislated today is $30 a ton, Canadian. Um, and it's legislated to go to 170 by the end of 2030. Now, 
that's a very clear price path. Anyone can plug that into their uh, Excel spreadsheet, even me, and help you know help figure out what's economic and what's not over the what's the DCF there. Um, secondly, in Europe, um, we see in the UK and Germany, other jurisdictions, no new internal combustion engine car sales legislated, regulated by 2030. That's about a model year, maybe but that's about a model, model and a half, basically, if you're an auto company. So their adjustment is starting today. Both of those aspects bring forward investment, and we're and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing an investment boom uh, in in both areas uh, around uh, that that's required because we have that combination of clear policy, a financial sector that is now becoming geared to it, um, and uh, and and economic and the economics of the underlying engineering. Now, last point. We don't have it's not all solved. And I'll do the Bill Gates shorthand. You know, there's about a third of emissions that require these breakthrough technologies. But boy, now the spotlight is being shone on those uh, those areas. And, uh, you know, for those who have uh, greater entrepreneurial flair, uh, ideas that drive innovation, risk, uh, willing to take risk. And there's a lot um, that's that's where the real uh, money will ultimately be made. Yeah, I, I would agree with you totally. We've seen a, a change in a variety of factors, including clean energy technology to deal with it. Obviously the electric car, new ways of monitoring and verifying drones, the, the ability to do a lot more in it, plus we've seen organized markets and governments like Canada and the UK behind it. And you as the, have a unique viewpoint as the, the only person that I've ever heard of to head two central banks, <laughs> the UK and, and Bank of Canada. But one thing that's changed dramatically in the, those last 25 years since Kyoto is China and India. And having been an actor and currently being a major player on the international stage, what's the future for, for India, China? How do they work into this brave new world of climate change? Yeah, well, the first thing, uh, absolutely, just orders of magnitude change in terms of their influence uh, and their engagement. Uh, you know, long, long gone um, in international policy of the days where, you know, ideas could be cooked up in, in Washington or in a G7 uh, meeting and then, you know, passed on to a grateful world that would then uh, either just receive the impact or implement them. Uh, we truly are in a multipolar world and, and, and absolutely uh, ever more so in, uh, with respect to climate. Uh, I would say, I'd make a couple of comments in terms of the engagement, I mean, clearly, and also clearly in terms of climate impact, climate footprint as, as China has, uh, has grown and industrialized, uh, obviously the largest emitter, uh, not the largest per capita, but the largest emitter in the world, uh, in India fast catching up as, uh, as it progresses, uh, which just puts, adds the urgency to it. Um, and in both cases, uh, you know, the superlatives hold largest emitter in China, largest producer of solar, uh, you know, uh, solar electricity, uh, the underlying uh, technologies, of course, essential for rare earths for storage, largest producer of uh, zero emission vehicles. So both both ends of the spectrum at the same time. Um, I'd say a, a couple of other things. One is that China is has been very engaged on this issue of climate change, particularly in the financial sector. So the People's Bank of China, which has really taken the lead, they were one of the founding central banks, along with the Bank of England, uh, Banque de France, a few others. Really, there were eight central banks that founded the group, and I will talk maybe about central banks later on, of, of what should central banks do about climate change. So PBOC right there at the start, uh, six years ago uh, in the run-up to Paris. Uh, and then on top of that, they've done a number of innovative things in terms of how they regulate cap bank capital and relate that to climate, um, how they use their uh, uh, central bank balance sheet with respect to climate. So uh, the Chinese have been uh, exceptionally innovative. I think one of the big uh, and necessary opportunities, both in China and India, is local currency um, debt that is either sustainable, green, or on the path to sustainability. You know, it's an asset class. You get both aspects of the asset class, you get the local currency and you also get the transition. So look, they're absolutely engaged at the table. And I, I'll make one other point, if I may, which is 
for this year for Glasgow, um, they will be, they, not just one or the other, will be uh, as, I, I want to say decisive in terms of uh, the scale of success. We are on the way, road to a good cop uh, in terms of everything that's been done and more commitments from large advanced economies, the US being in there, what's happening on the finish. All of that leads to a good cop. We have a good, good outcome if we'd happen tomorrow. We need a great cop. And the difference between a good cop and a great cop uh, is going to be uh, the, the commitment and the uh, contribution, particularly of China and India. Uh, thank you. Just for people who may not be familiar oh, sorry, yeah. with COP, uh, that's the conference of the parties, and it's a UN uh, bit of jargon. And this one coming up in Glasgow, I think, promises to be one. Um, and I agree with you, and I also think it's very dangerous to short China's ability to quickly address a problem. Um, at the end of June, and it apparently is sticking that they will implement a national cap and trade system uh, with the Shanghai Environmental Exchange kicking off trading. And we understand it's going to be at the end of June, which is um, days short of the 100 and uh, plus anniversary of the Communist Party. So th there could be some, some real announcements. And I agree with you that the, the coming COP could be very important. I, you know, we have today with us, Mark, some prominent uh, bankers, um, which are not the international, not the money center, but they're regional mid-sized community banks. They represent maybe 11 trillion in, in assets, half the US banking system. And I think their issue is how the, should they approach sustainability? How will it impact the, a regional bank or a community bank? How about the minority depository institutions and where do these regional banks, minority banks all fit into the Glasgow Financial Alliance, which you yeah. have been instrumental in? Okay, so this is a critically important point, and I'm glad you, you go right to the heart of it, which is, so what we need to do, um, there are certain aspects of climate change and climate change policy and things in financial markets and, and the adjustments that will principally affect and course through, if I can put it that way, the large global money center banks, the systemic institutions, the largest asset managers. And of course, there's some trickle down impact of that on all of us, but that's at, that's at the core. So why would we want um, the uh, regional banks, the smaller banks, what you would call, one would call in the UK, and a, a version of this is the building societies, you know, what, what equivalent of savings and loans, but also just smaller commercial banks. Why do we want at the table for precisely uh, the types of issue that you're raising? Well, first off, the importance, you know, 11 trillion of assets, uh, dealing with the small businesses, dealing with individuals, dealing with mortgages, residential, also some commercial. So they're just at the lifeblood of the economy. So uh, that's that's the first reason. The second reason is there's often, or at least there's potential um, for conflicting responsibilities. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, there are responsibilities, say community reinvestment, uh, responsibilities or the nature of the asset uh, bit of the balance sheet. It's not a responsibility, but just the nature of the balance sheet. I could be um, have quite substantial residential uh, mortgage uh, exposure, um, in part my ability to have truly green mortgages, partly determined by the quality of the home and the you know whether it's retrofit. In other words, does it have you know uh, better insulation and tighter windows and all those sorts of things. But also what matters is the grid or whether it's a gas, you know, how is it heated? But the, you can't change that as the regional bank, right? So there's a limit to what you can do, uh, either because of other obligations you have or because of the regional concentration uh, and the nature of, um, uh, of, of the nature of uh, nature of that. And part of the point of the GFANS and the net zero banking alliance, which is at the heart of it, is to bring these issues to the fore. 
and to uh, really shine a light on uh, situations where there has to be other support, other policies, non-financial policies that are going to help with the transition of the housing stock, that are going to help with the transition of smaller commercial real estate. Uh, and of course, you know, the financial institutions, the, the banks will participate in this, but that policy set isn't necessarily there. So that's the, I think, one of the most important points. The other point I will make, though, is that particularly on the business side, um, what's happening with our larger businesses is that they're more and more looking at the emissions in their supply chain, their so-called scope three emissions in the, in the jargon. What it means is, you know, that my suppliers, as well as just me, just my plant or activities. That alignment uh, creates incentives to, uh, you know, to compensate for uh, emissions reductions for those smaller businesses. It means that knowing at least in a representative way what your emissions are is going to become more and more important. So this is going to cascade down to smaller businesses over the course, I would say, over the next three to five years. Uh, the better, bigger you know, uh, buyers of their products are going to help them with this. Uh, but it is an expertise I think uh, is going to need to be developed uh, for uh, for bankers. It's another it's another tool in the um, in, in the toolkit. It'll come a little slower than it does uh, for the bigger ones, but it, it will be there in the end. We see a lot of um, the banks that are members of the exchange financing a lot of farmers. Isn't there a role for agriculture as well in, in low-till and no-till and yeah. reforestation of, of parts of the farms, things like this? So there so this, Yeah, Richard, as usual, you, you, you put your finger on one of the most exciting aspects here in an untapped uh, markets in, in many respects. Uh, look, we you know, depending where you are, uh, agriculture emissions are certainly in the mid-teens uh, in terms of overall emissions. So what does that tell you? It tells you we could do lots of things over here with vehicles and steel and electricity, et cetera. We're still not going to get to net zero unless we um, address a set of issues around agriculture. Uh, the flip side of that is there's lots of opportunity to reduce the emission footprint uh, of agriculture. You, you mentioned low-till, no-till, um, so-called nature, which is a nature-based solution. Other nature-based solutions include reforestation, um, different types, uh, different crop selections and others. Uh, and what we don't have yet, but what, as you know, because you're supporting it, what we're working towards is having a big global market that will mean you get paid for that. You get paid directly for uh, the emission reduction, the emissions avoided. I mean, in the, to be clear, again, sophisticated audience, when you're reforesting, you're actually reducing emissions. Um, when you're uh, when you're just keeping your forest, you're avoiding emissions. Uh, but you can be paid for either. And what we're looking to do is to build on your work uh, and set up a proper global market for that. We think this can go from just under a billion a year at present, or it's a little less than that, um, to 100 billion a year quite quickly be, as, as this starts to shift in. And at the core uh, will be what, what I was referring to as nature-based solutions, many of which uh, you know, can be in, uh, in, in the North American content, a lot of which will be in emerging and developing uh, economies as well. Yeah, and I, I think we see that as opportunities for the regionals, mid-size yeah. and community banks because they're financing farmers. They could, and if farmers are able to have two sources of revenue, one above the ground called food and one below the ground called negative emissions, then we have, uh, you know, to use an overused phrase, we do have a win-win. We have a, we have a double farming, right? Farming above, farming below the ground. How about the, the message that these banks said, and that we deal with have had an enormous role in PPP and lending to small businesses and disproportionately creating jobs, according to Jeremy Stein at Harvard. You know, they have a 
How about their customers? You know, they reach enormous amounts of people that aren't in the big population centers. What about consumers? Uh, and how can they partake and contribute it to this net zero world? Yeah, and I think, you know, and of course the banks know their customers best. Um, so it, it, and people, everyone's different. So it's along a spectrum to the extent to which people uh, value this uh, shift towards net zero. And, you know, my experience in a variety of jurisdictions is, you know, the younger you go, the more they, the bigger proportion care about it. And if they care about it, they care about it a lot. Uh, and that's likely to increase. And, and the good thing is what's happening is the ability to, um, uh, the ability to track carbon is improving exponentially. And so what? What that means is I can do a couple of things as a financial institution. I can offer, increasingly I can offer, and some of the major um, credit card companies have started to do this, you know, represent our purchases. What's my carbon footprint of what I'm buying? Um, so I can track it as an individual. I can move it that way. I also will be uh, increasingly able to track the carbon footprint of my portfolio, of those who I lend to. So if, if, if you or I have a deposited bank you know, a bank X, well, is it a bank that's contributing to three degrees global warming or is it contributing less than two, which is what uh, after, after all is the objective. So is it a sustainable bank, is it not? And that's part of the work. That's part of the plumbing that we're doing for uh, for this COP meeting for Glasgow. It doesn't matter that, that that just happens to be a date we're working towards is something we need for the sector. So we can, you know, a bank, if it chooses, can track much more clearly what the impact of its clients are on the climate. And very importantly, not just today, but in the future, because what we want, look, we're all starting from where we are. We're not, we can't go back to Kyoto. We're starting, you know, we can't get younger, Richard. We gotta start from where we are, <laughs> starting here. And we are, and uh, what we need to do is put money in, get behind companies uh, and individuals who have good ideas and, and, and good plans to reduce emissions. And so I don't want to be penalized today for giving money to somebody who might be high emission if they're going to be lower emission. And so, but we need a consistent way of answering that question. So there's not greenwashing and other factors. I think we're going to get there. And what it means just to roll it back up to your core question, what can I offer my client? I can tell my client increasingly what kind of bank I am. You know, are they, uh, you know, am I, am I part of the solution? Uh, but also on an individual basis, the ability to track carbon, you know, for me, if I care strongly about this, manage my own carbon footprint uh, and the bank is helping me do that. And then I adjust my behavior and it, and it just amplifies the impact. I think what we're both saying, Mark, and I, I think it's an important message to all of those banks who are out there listening, and that is that doing well and doing good aren't incompatible, that we can uh, do things that are good for the environment and good for our business. They're not natural enemies. Um, and we've seen, um, lots of uh, growth in the interest in markets and, and Chris Giancarlo, who uh, is a colleague and a friend uh, and a public member of our board, I know has worked with you in the past and he has a notable record of public service and he's doing that now with digital dollars and things like this. Chris, as a as a regulator, you know what are the 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 the, the key question that you might focus on for Governor Carney for Mark uh, to to share with the audience? Yeah, it's something actually that Mark picked up on earlier. He mentioned that central banks are increasingly stepping up to to the challenge of climate risk, and certainly here in the United States, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Powell has spoken of increased focus of the Federal Reserve on the importance of, uh, of sustainability. And my former agency, the CFTC, has convened a very important uh, committee on environmental markets and is looking at that. And I think, Richard, you have the honor of serving on that committee. So I, I guess the question would be, you know, what are your th thoughts on how central banks should approach the impact of climate change in the financial sector? Yeah, and Chris, it's fantastic to see you again. And we. 
<laughs> any advice you can give us on any of these markets is uh, is absolutely welcome. And um, and I'll just underscore how important what you're doing on the digital dollar and uh, and that future, which is going to make a huge impact, is is already making it even bigger. Um, look, first off, as you well know, um, but it bears repeating, it depends on the central bank. You know, they're not all created equally. Uh, they have different responsibilities. Uh, Bank of Canada, where my first job was, uh, you know, basically we set monetary policy and then we, you know, carped from the sidelines about financial stability, but that's all we did. So for Bank of Canada, it's relatively limited. It's basically analytic, not much more. I mean, to be blunt, Bank of England, huge range of responsibilities oversee the insurance industry, banks, and also systemic risk in the system. So very much larger role of responsibility. Also, my uh, successor just received three letters from the chancellor you know, uh, who said, take climate change into account uh, in those uh, various responsibilities. So they have a much more active role. Um, and, and I'll summarize in terms of the ways we uh, central banks can play a role. The first in the sort of analytic or advisory role in creating new markets. And as you, and this is very much uh, your two uh, areas of expertise, you know, at the heart of this um, uh, offset market and some of these other uh, climate market, these are basically OTC derivative markets, right? They, they, they maybe at the core, you've got an exchange traded product. It's, and you know better than anybody, they've got to be properly organized. Uh, you know, they either sink or swim that way and they've got to be resilient. And so that expertise supplemented with those who really know what they're talking about, that's first thing. Second is, um, if they supervise banks, and Bank of England does, um, it's making sure that the banks uh, are thinking about these risks, not telling them what to do, but thinking about these risks, and not just the physical risks, but what happens if um, there is a new fuel standard which uh, uh, makes certain activities uncompetitive, or there is a carbon price and it goes up. D do the scenario analysis and think about the scenario, which it's going to sound strange, but the riskiest scenario from a transition risk perspective for lending book is often that actually we accomplish what we say we're gonna do, right? Climate policy is tough enough that we get it to one and a half degrees and then very quickly a number of industries are not successful. So think in those terms. Um, and then the third thing is, uh, is, is thinking about those uh, building blocks and, uh, for those markets and, and, and contribute uh, to all of that. Last thing that some of them will do, and the Bank of England just this week uh, showed his hand on this, is in part because it received a letter about exactly this very thing, is take climate change into account in your monetary policy operations. So every bit of that word was, or that phrase was important, not your interest rate setting, your, your QE, et cetera, but the type of collateral you take uh, in, uh, when you're providing liquidity into the system. And as you both well know, that that's very powerful. You change uh, access to central bank collateral. You change the haircut because of the climate factor. It has a very good chance of cascading through the system and, and pricing through the system. So not every central bank is going to do all that. You know, the Fed is going to be more limited in what they, I mean, my judgment, what they do relative to uh, the Bank of England, take those extremes, Bank of Canada less still. But there, there is quite a broad range uh, that uh, that will influence how markets function and hopefully uh, influence uh, the creation of, uh, of the markets we need. Excellent. Uh, Tom, as a, an academic and as a dean um, and as an economist and, and somebody who focuses on law and economics, What's the next step, or what do you think uh, Governor Carney uh, might be able to shed light on from your point of view? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. It's, you know, just as you mentioned, it's with Mark, you're a special advisor to Prime Minister Johnson. And, you know, as academics, we're very interested in the political economy of the upcoming COP26. And, you know, can you shed any light on that about? what recent developments might emerge uh, or not for a global mandate in dealing with, with climate change. Those of us who are academics are really watching this with an incredible degree of interest. So we're eager for any, any insights that you may offer. Yeah, well, thank you, Tom. I mean, it's, um, it's about as complicated a thing as I've been involved. And I, I sometimes take comfort in the fact that I'm only dealing with the financial sector. In fact, I often take comfort in that. I mean, it's complicated enough, as you know, the financial sector. But when you throw in all the other elements of a climate negotiation uh, with 195 plus countries, with 
in the language common but differentiated responsibilities. So we all started from different positions, so we don't all have to do the same thing at the same time, uh, with a sense of uh, not just intergenerational climate justice, but justice between advanced economies who helped cause the problem uh, and developing uh, countries who are bearing the biggest brunt, um, but haven't yet caught up. Uh, there, there is a host of things. Now, let me start with the positive and then I'll, I'm going to end with a couple of the challenges, if I may, which is the positive is we've got the shift towards net zero and what we have seen and it was accelerated by uh, the Biden summit last month is that the G7 particularly, but a little more broadly in the advanced economies are stepping up. The, the, the commitments have been ramped up uh, and that they themselves, not quite there, but more or less in line with a if, if, they, if they achieve what they say they're gonna achieve uh, with where we need to go for one and a half degrees. So more or less in the, in the ballpark, uh, at least, little, little tweaking needed there. Um, but there's another range of uh, advanced economies who need to move. And then we need the big emerging uh, markets, particularly uh, the ones we talked about, but uh, I'd, I'd throw Brazil in as well, to do really to grab the nettle, China kind of did, uh, which is to say when they're going to peak and then when they're going to get to net zero. So part of the debate is about the, the, the delta between, you know, how rapidly from the peak do I get to the to this zero uh, and challenges nonetheless. And we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. It's moving in that direction. The more confident, it's not the answer to all questions, but the more confident these countries are that finance is going to flow to them to help with that transition, uh, the scale. I think the easier that becomes uh, doesn't solve it. Um, but there are there are um, you know I there there are a couple of technical I shouldn't say technical there there there's an issue around a commitment which was made ten years ago in Copenhagen that the advanced economies would support the transition and the cost of climate uh, in in developing economies uh, to the tune of hundred billion dollars a year. It's various forms of money, but suffice to say, we're at like 72 to 75 at the moment. There's a gap. The question is, will that gap be filled? That's more important than it sounds. In the big scheme of things, um, it's it's. I hate to say 100 billion isn't that much money, but it's not that much money in climate terms. We, you know, we saw the IEA say that we need five trillion a year for energy investment uh, for a number of years in most in emerging economies. So it's, but it politically your question, political economy, that matters. And I'll, I'll, I'll say one other thing, which um, is, is a concern, it's an emerging concern, which is, uh, you know, this really is the first global, there's not many global agreements, uh, cooperation, things like this. Uh, and it's certainly uh, the first one post COVID or at, after since COVID happened, uh, and it's the most high profile. And, you know, the challenges we're having, the collective we were having in, addressing COVID globally, I mean, it was tough enough locally, but to do it globally and to um, uh, you know, get vaccine, vaccine uh, access, et cetera, around, uh, that may influence the, um, the amount of goodwill uh, that, that is there for a global agreement. And you know, this is, I mean, it's a 195 country agreement. So you don't have to have that many agreed parties in order for it to be exceptionally challenging. Uh, so, my 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 balance sheet is net positive, but but with some uh, with some warnings on that. As we're going ahead, and and I uh, want to end it shortly because I know you have a hard stop, Mark. But a couple of observations, uh, and just uh, and would see if you would concur. Often there are things that are going on that become apparent later, that, that there's a signal, whether it's a price signal, whether it's a COP meeting that generates a lot of activity and we don't see it later. And if you read the news carefully and you take a look at the headlines are, oh my God, Shell just got uh, told by the Dutch courts that it's got to lower emissions. Exxon has gotten new members of the board. But yet you look at 
Exxon going into refining vegetable oils and turning them into biodiesels, and they're making $500 million investment mm -hmm. in that sector. These are very substantial. And while we don't see it in the United States, the message is there's really a lot happening that isn't very evident. The headline capturing doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of the ground. The US, which has been a surplus, as Chris, as you know, in vegetable oil since soybeans started being crushed, could be net short by the time you get into biodiesel. So we have a vast revolution uh, where what is could be a fossil fuel industry turns into a renewable fuel industry and refineries that Carl Icahn is buying could be used for renewables. So I wondered if, if it's your assessment as a central banker, do you, we often see things come out later rather than sooner as is this your experience <laughs> with the environment? <laughs> I mean, with the sole exception of uh, price uh, price pressures and inflation pressures, I would say a central banker is almost always going to see things later than a market participant. <laughs> but, uh, we, you know, there's one area of ex uh, comparative advantage. I think, you know, I, I agree with your characterization. I think one of the things that's happening, which makes this such an exciting time, and interesting Chris's uh, perspective, is that you get this organizing principle around net zero, you get policies starting to back up that. Look, there is a bunch of roughly 60% of emissions can be reduced with existing technologies applied at scale. Think of wind, solar, that's just rolling out. There's a series of things like that. But then there's 40%, which is that breakthrough. Some of it's, you know, biodiesel is basically there, but you know, hyd the hydrogen economy, green and blue, shifting over carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, sustainable aviation fuels, uh, small modular reactors, and on and on. There's a series of things in storage and others. And that's where, you know, that's where the innovators, uh, you know, the entrepreneurs are going. And uh, and 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 that's what, you know, I can I can give you that list, and I could maybe talk for another minute or two about each of those. But that's it. I don't really know. But I'm not so worried about that because people who really know, and you know, some of it, a lot of them are going to fail. But you know, the amount of capital and energy that is now flowing into these areas is is enormous, and it's hugely empowering. And and having the U.S. properly and fully focused on it, it's fantastic. Yeah, that's what what I was. Hoping I can't in a final question, um, Mark, uh, you've achieved so much and you're fundamentally a, a wonderful human being. And, and I, you know, Stop that. I know every, your values are terrific. This is a hallowed university. You started, you know, in Alberta, you, achieved a lot through your education, hard work. Uh, I think you're probably a little like most of us who are surprised that, at what you've achieved in life. What advice do you have to the young students that might be here about, you know, just life and education and your story, just yeah. your personal just observations, Mark Carney. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> okay. So well, look, I'll tell you the advice. Uh, and I got it, I've got it a few times and I've sort of lived it. And um, uh, which is it's it may sound slightly odd, but the value of humility. And I'll be specific about that. You know, the humility is exactly what one of the things you said. Uh, so yeah, I worked hard and all that sort of stuff, but I got, you know, it's a series of luck along the way and with doors open and I, you know, got through them and they, it, they led to other things. So, you know, with that success comes uh, responsibility and give back. And that's why, you know, that's why Chris is after he, you know, goes through the meat grinder, being CFTC chair is still doing stuff on the public side, right? It was why you, uh, you know, uh, do what you do and Tom does what he does. I mean, that, so first thing is that aspect of humility. Second is that, um, uh, well, now this is the central banker for me, uh, in me, which part of humility is planning for failure, recognize that things can go wrong in ways you can't admit it and, or can't see in advance. And so a bit of that preparation. Uh, and then the third thing is, um, 
you, you know, in the end, were custodians of our organization. I mean, I, look, I was lucky, as I say, the, the right place, right time, governor of the Bank of England. There's two reactions you can have to that. When you're sitting in this magisterial room, you know, Chris, we've had a number of meetings and that, you know, it's fantastic. And, you know, people in big coats walking around and this thing, you think, oh, I'm fant- you know, I'm great. On the other hand, the whole place reeks of it's, you know, there were 120 people before you. There's another couple hundred coming after you. Your, pastor, your job is to leave it better. Your job is to make it better. And that's, you know, the contribution in the end. And if you do make it better, actually, uh, and actually, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, one of the last things I did as governor, uh, they have a New Year's church service uh, in the city of London. So I went to that and I sat there with the Lord Mayor of London. He's I'm 120th governor. He's 694th Lord Mayor. And the priest or whatever, the reverend gets up and says, how many of those can you name of, the, of your predecessors? Like three, four, that's it. And in, and in you know a few generations they won't remember who you are, but maybe what you did and how you did it, particularly how you did it, that will leave a legacy, uh, and that's the, the sort of values that live on. So that's that's a long answer to your question, but I think that's linked in uh, through humility. I I I think it couldn't have been a more perfect uh, end to the fireside conversation, Mark. Uh, you're. Uh, we all want to feel we gave back a bit, uh, not as much as, as we hope, but at least more than uh, better than we started with it. So I want to thank you personally. I know your schedule has been very hard and you're in great demand. And the very fact that we've had the privilege of talking with you for an hour won't be forgotten and the advice in particular to the young people uh, couldn't be more important and couldn't be right on so will all of you just join me in <laughs> thank you metaphorically Fantastic. physically thank you for a great conversation whatever we can do to help you mark in any of your causes you know all of us are here and i'll speak on behalf of, of Chris and Tom and the universities and other places who uh, you understand so well. So Great. thank you. Great. Well, stay safe. And we really appreciate it. Uh, this is wonderful. Perfect. Thank you all.